Hi. In today's lecture, we're going to look at the life of the people who live in North Africa, who are nomadic and or live in the region prior to the arrival of Islam, and how Islam has been incorporated into their lives while still maintaining many of the traditional cultures and characters that existed long before the arrival of Islam. To begin with, I want to talk about the Imazirin, which is the plural form of the Amazir, who live in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Mauritania, Western Sahara, and the Canary Islands as well as parts of Mali, Egypt, and Niger. They are often referred to as Berbers. This is a term the Greeks and Romans used for over a thousand years. But it's these Amizid who consider the term derogatory. It's derived from a Greek word, barbaria, which meaning barbarians, which originally meant the people who spoke a language the Romans and Greeks did not understand. They talked. Barbar, they talk nonsense. And so when we look at what these people actually uh, exist, the kinds of cultural artifacts that still exist, we find many traditions that are uh, widespread throughout this region that have really important sort of cultural touchstones. One, of course, is jewelry. And the use of jewelry is a, a do, an adornment. The other uh, is tattoos among the women. And we can see here in North Africa the way this woman has this tattoo on her chin. It can also appear on forehead and on the cheeks. The tattoos are symbolic of fertility symbols. They can represent uh, palm trees and they can re represent this idea of a river flowing, the idea of, of water, and other marks of fertility and as a sign of adulthood. The jewelry can be quite elaborate and quite heavy and large. Um, traditionally, it is used in uh, silver, uh, and silver even before the arrival of Islam. This necklace called the is, uh has an orange-colored amber, believed to offer protection. Amber is a kind of petrified uh, sap that uh, comes into this kind of wonderful, warm, glowing so stone. So this regular large uh, silver jewelry is crafted in these sort of uh, designs that reflect uh, wealth, prosperity, and protection from evil. So traditionally, an Amizé man would give this kind of jewelry uh, to their bride before the wedding. The bride wore the gifts during the ceremony and afterward in their day-to-day -day life as a sign of their marital status. Jewelry also served as a kind of portable bank account. A woman could cash in if her husband passed away or if the family experienced financial hardship. So it's sort of like a way of not just showing your wealth, but also a way of kind of maintaining a, a kind of uh, investment that would be protected. As, aside from being portable wealth, um, coins uh, make a lot of noise when the wearers moves. So a group of women wearing jewelry would have a, a, a significant sort of auditory compliment and as a way of kind of alerting people that they're here and as a way of kind of uh, being protected and set, feeling safe. Um, the red color in the coral around the headband is sometimes associated with femininity, femininity and fertility. Um, and they're also now associated with this idea of baraka. We talked about baraka, this idea of a blessing. This is an Islamic idea that the jewelry um, offers a kind of blessing to those who wear it, those who experience it, and it sort of passes on through the community. Some of the designs in the jewelry, the shapes and patterns, have very important symbolic qualities, not just the material and the jewels, but the patterns. One very common pattern that you'll find in the 
North African jewelry is called the Hamsa design. And it's really, you have to imagine, a pair of hands on top of each other with their thumbs pointing out and the fingers pointing forward. And this is a gesture that is used to as a protection against the evil eye. And a lot of times the evil eye is people who are jealous of your wealth, people who are jealous of your prosperity, uh, are looking at you uh, with um, a kind of curse, and then you uh, will lose all your wealth and prosperity. So this is one of the symbols that says a kind of warning and protection against people who would wish ill will of you. The uh, other very interesting design in North Africa is called the fibula. And this uh, large geometric triangles with the pierced pin that sort of hooks into cape or shawl and is worn over the shoulders. This design of the fibula is actually borrowed from the uh, a Roman design that comes into uh, popularity over a thousand years ago and it has continued to be used today as one of the ways in which Roman culture continues to show up in um, traditional households of, of the Amazi. Now the other thing I want you to point out is notice how there is a complete lack of realistic representation. There are no flowers, there are no um, birds or animals or images of people. And this again is the Islamic influence that is evident throughout this area that the influence of geometry and symmetry is part of the sort of Islamic aesthetic that has become ingrained in the culture today. So we talk about the people who are nomads in the northern region. There are a number of different groups that populate the region. The largest and most well-known are the Tuareg, and I'll be talking mostly about them, with a few other examples of people. The Tuareg have had a very long history in this very profitable region of communicating and moving goods from Mali. We talked about the archaeological work in Mali and moving it up into uh, the Mediterranean, sort of being a conduit, uh, bringing salt and other precious materials down and gathering gold and moving those north. The Tuareg camel caravans played a primary role in trans-Saharan trade until the mid-20th century, and now, of course, the camel has been supplanted by these massive trucks that can uh, withstand the heat and sand of the desert. The Tuareg are predominantly Muslim, though they are not considered Arabic. They have in them this long history of, of being independent and autonomous, but they do observe all the common rights and, and uh, religious practices of, of most Muslims, but they don't always observe the, some of the same cultural ideas. One of the things you see in the dress of the men among the Tuareg is that they will wear uh, veils. Uh, the women will not be veiled, but the men wear veils, uh, usually starting around age 25. Here we see the Tuareg chieftain, Siade Ibrahim, with his family in the Tuareg palace in 2005. And you notice that the wear of veil in, in the, among the Amizin, the Tuareg, is an idea of having and possessing a certain kind of calm reserve, controlling one's power, one's emotions, one's passions, and to be able to negotiate calmly and coolly. <clears throat> These men are traders. They have a long history of trade and in the region. And so being Muslim, they need to be able to communicate and uh, trade with people in very far flung areas. Notice the dark garment the man on the right is wearing. That is indigo dye. And it's an extremely deep indigo dye. So deep is it, it says it's known to dye the skin of the people who wear it even darker. So the people who are Tuareg often appear 
in this kind of uh, deep purple uh, skin color as the indigo is kind of uh, rubbed off on them. Many different crafts uh, and traditional art making can be found among nomads. Things that they prize highly, that they carry with them on their journeys. Uh, everything needs to be portable. And so here we have an El Jibira, which is a uh, kind of like a, a suitcase of sorts. It allows people to carry and protect clothing uh, and wrapped inside. This is all made of leather and camel leather is treated. Leather working is a tradition done by the women. So uh, that is one way in which the women have uh, their artistic traditions. And we see this a lot among the nomads is that there's women's work and then there's men's work. And this is gonna become an important theme in our discussion about nomadic cultures is the way in which these two different spheres of labor are meant to uh, enhance one another. That the men are in the public sphere, they're traders, they're out, the women are in the domestic sphere, they're protected, they're within the enclosure. And so these, these boundaries are very clearly delineated in the Tuareg culture and other nomadic civilizations. Men's work is often uh, the work of metal and, and metal smithing. And here is the traditional sword design used among the Tuareg called the Takuba. It's a design for a sword that is very closely modeled after a Roman weapon, a very similar design. So the Takoba here, uh, the metal work would have been fashioned by a man, and then the leather work that accentuates the, the handle and the hilt, that would have been the, and the, the guard there, that would have been, and the, and the sheath, all of that leather work have been done by women. And so even though they separate these labors, they collaborate in these in, on specific works in different ways. Another very interesting way in which the Tuareg traditions and other nomads, um, they bear uh, a, some relation to the ancient Egyptians as well. We can see in the Tuareg tent, the, the bed is a rather large structure that is used to sort of stabilize the, the whole tent. It's sort of anchoring the tent, and it's actually based on an ancient Egyptian design. Notice how the, the bed structure there is, is built in a way to a stand um, and give it the kind of sturdy quality that's needed to withstand uh, the winds of the desert inside the tent having the it sort of stabilizes the whole structure. The construction of the tent in a desert climb means that there's a lot of preparation necessary for the materials of tent making and that these must be built, maintained, and then packed up and preserved. As you can see in the environment here, uh, around the Sahara region and the Sahel, there are very few uh, trees and branches that would be of the right size and diameter to make tent building possible. And so the tent structures of the Tuareg are a very fine art practiced by the women who must uh, be constantly on the alert for ways of enhancing and improving on their tent building uh, 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 tools and abilities. So structural mobility and adaptability is essential for survival. And this is my main point here, and that to survive in this harsh climate, to maintain stable social organization, the separation of labor, the separation of responsibilities and skills, this is a very important part. It makes it more efficient. If everyone knows from birth the kind of work they have to do, it's a much more efficient way to operate. You are trained at a very young age to learn these skills. And because they don't have written records and they can't write things down, you're not expected to 
look it up in a book, you have to memorize it. You have to know it. You have to have it deeply ingrained in your body memory, these skills to allow the society, the family to survive in these very harsh climes. So nomadic life is a very precarious existence and it's, it's one that requires uh, a constant attention to the details of your essential needs. Here you can see the way in which the structure uh, of the saddle that is used on the camel is an important part of how to create something that is balanced so it rests on the camel evenly and that it deals with the uh, difficult anatomy of the camel, its humps and, and the way in which you need to sort of straddle those so that the camel can effectively move and carry these heavy weights. And so part of the tent design has to incorporate the, the camel anatomy and camel needs as well. So there's this, another part of the equation that the women must be aware of. Here we can see some women, some Gabra women, uh, building and uh, packing up their tent and tent materials. The tent in this tradition is one that has deep roots and symbolism in the society and is closely associated with every part of a woman's existence. Maintaining the tent, keeping up the home, making sure the tent is in fine working order. This is this, this very key responsibility that, that women have. So there is a, a very elaborate marriage ritual that establishes the patterns uh, for the design of, of the life. The, the, the wife appears in a special palanquin. Then um, part of the ceremony is sort of arriving in the new family compound. The wife receives her new home as a dowry from her mother. Okay, so this is something that her mother has prepared for her that she will bring into adding her wealth to this new family. And if her husband wishes to divorce or separate from her, she gets to keep that wealth. She gets to maintain that household. So the husband has to be on good behavior because if anyone's leaving the home, it's him. Now the tent processes are elaborate and very formal and as you see uh, the comparison here between the sort of ordinary palanquin on the left and the more elaborate uh, wedding palanquin on the right, that the wedding has this sense of sort of heightened signification in the idea of the nomad's life. Here we're going to look at this, this very important uh, wedding tent, the Kel Ferwan, and it is sort of modeled after your ordinary tent, uh, but it's a little bit more elaborate, a little bit more dressed up and uh, with decorative elements in it as well. But the basic architecture of it is an essential part of the maintaining a home here. And the, the name, the word for wife and the word for tent is one and the same, right? So during the wedding ceremony, which can take over a month to complete, the, the family uh, builds their tent in the center of a, in a encircled compound and then uh, after seven days of having the tent in that one location the tent is taken down packed up on the camels and it's ceremonially marched around the perimeter of the enclosure and then brought to a new location so you see it's one and then two is slightly to the left and then three is to the north and then four is to the east and then finally five is in the south. And this movement each time after seven days being in one location, meaning that there's going to be five different occasions for this woman to take down and rebuild this house as a part of the marisomi because she has to know how to do this. She has to be able to demonstrate that she can, for the rest of her life, be able to build and take down and maintain and preserve carefully all the equipment needed to sustain the family in her tent.